Hello, welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinga, and this is episode number 463. That's Cuatro Seis Tres with me, your host, Agostino. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing. Good to hear. If it's your first time taking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like button, hit subscribe, turn your notification bell and all that good stuff. If you're listening via the podcast app, please give me a five star review and share it with your family and friends. And of course, support via Patreon to get access to my bonus episodes and shows and content is also greatly appreciated at patreon.com for slash Agostino to get bonus episodes and content that you can't get anywhere else for as little as one dollar, the equivalent of one pound. Sign up to my Patreon now. Get involved on there. Don't delay. What are you waiting for? Ah, oh, how you doing? How you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling happy, feeling strong. I've been doing sit-ups and push-ups, you know, using my yoga mat. Look at those. Look at look at that bicep. Can you see that bicep, bro? A little bit of cell there, but that, that's, that's going to come off soon enough, right? Right? But forget that bit there. But look look at that. Nice, isn't it, right? It's coming, man. Like, little by little. Can you see it in the sun there? Can you see it in the sun? Is that all right? All right? It's coming up little by little, piece by piece. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting to a good place. But yeah, doing sit-ups, doing push-ups, running a bunch, trying my darndest to make sure that I'm in trim and proper shape for June 21st party in the USA. Cannot wait. I'm sure most of you out there are in the same sort of vein as I am, ready to go and paint the town red. As I mentioned in the previous podcast, I'm thinking I might go to Cat Island, also known as um, Egg, to go and celebrate the beginning of being back on the dance floor once again. I might go to Ket Island, mate. Yeah, be surrounded by all the lads and you know, be surrounded by all the senoritas and senors from places such as Spain and Italy, right? Shaking our booty, waving our hands in the air, right? Speaking to Stefano in the toilets or something, right? That's what I'm gonna be doing. Um, I might end up having to do that. I don't really want to go because egg is a is a place full of just debauchery and pure hedonism and just you know reckless abandon. And, you know, messiness, really, right? Egg is the home of messiness. But so, f- no, to be fair, I've not been there for a while. It might be for more than five years. So f- since then, I think they've had a bit of a refurb. Obviously, the programming has changed somewhat. It's like a tech house kind of, you know, a mecca for the most part. Um, there is obviously some deep housey type of people, but usually it's sort of the kind of tech housey... <sighs> whistling you know fingers flicking in the air type people so that should be a bit of a wave that should be a bit of a session um so yeah hopefully i'm looking forward to that that's been about it so obviously training working hard fasting like an absolute beast doing what 20 i'm doing 20 uh 40 right 2040 yeah no 24 24 to 24 which basically means you fast for 20 hours and you eat within a four hour window so far so good I'm feeling fine, feeling healthy, feeling strong, actually. I'm feeling probably the most alert I've felt in a while. Like, right now, as I'm talking to you, I've not had a coffee, and I'm already, like, you know, ready to go, like, you know, jittering all over the place. So that's a fairly good sign. No coffee, no supplements, no nothing. You know what I mean? The only thing I've taken is an anti allergy tablets and a couple of puffs of my inhaler. But that's been about it. I've not had anything else to kind of be, put me in this mood, which is kind of mad. So I'm looking forward to doing that. But I don't know, man. I'm, I'm a bit nervous. I'm a bit nervous about getting back on a dance floor because I'm not going to have the rhythm that I had before, I don't think. Um, it's going to be a bit of a mad one. It's going to be a bit of a mad one. Um, obviously, I'm not, I won't be fully vaccinated, I think, by then either, to be fair. I might have had one jab, might not have had any jabs. I'm not too sure. So that's going to be a bit of a mad one too. So yeah, man, a lot of things left up in the air about where and how that's going to impact life going forward but hey man we've got to get back to some semblance of normality in it we have to get back to some semblance of normality so talking about normality and going back we're going to get right on in with the show so if you've got a little drink i actually finished my bottle of water you know what madly enough i bought six bottles of um what's that water i bought i bought six bottles of highland springs right six and i've managed to finish all of them on my own oh all of them so far i've only got one bottle left pretty mad isn't it like there was a time in my life where i would only drink fizzy drinks and juices and it took me a while to build up the tolerance to be able to enjoy water but i'm thankful that i do actually legitimately enjoy drinking drinking water and now i'm at a stage in my life where i can't even drink an entire bottle 
of a fizzy drink in one sitting. It has to kind of, I have to drink it and then kind of carry it around with me the whole day, which then leads it to being warm, temp, um, room temperature, which then leads it to being flat. You know what I mean? Like, it's not really the same. But I don't know if it's you or, or I don't know if maybe it's not just me, actually. Have anyone noticed that fizzy drinks aren't as fizzy as they used to be when you were a kid? Is it a tolerance thing when you get older or have they completely changed the recipe? Because I remember when I was a kid, you could like shake a bottle only a couple of times, you open it and it would legitimately explode in your hands. You'd have a couple of sips and your belly would be like, you know, bubbling all over the place. You'd be burping all over the place. Like the ingestion would be for real, right? It was a real flipping battle to finish a bottle of lemonade. But you did it anyway because the sugar just tasted so good when you're a kid. But I wonder if they've like purposely, because I know Coke in McDonald's, for instance, is a good example. I think McDonald's did a thing to make people buy the more healthier version. I don't know if it's a, if it's a healthy thing or if it's just a cost-cutting thing, but I know for if you order a meal at McDonald's, um, it comes, the standard drink that it sort of comes with, a fizzy drink, is the Coke, is a zero option, the zero sugar one, whatever that is, if it's Fanta or if it's a Coke. So if you want the regular Coke, you have to kind of select it and it's like 30p extra or something, right? So they've obviously done a thing where they're purposely trying to encourage people to drink the more, you know, the one that supposedly has the less sugar in it, which, you know, is obviously a lie. You know, there's no such thing as a zero fat flipping um, or there's no such thing as a guilt-free fizzy drink. It is what it is. You make the decision to drink it, you drink it anyway, but don't fool yourself into thinking it's going to be as good as drinking a bottle of water, but... There are some people that do exist like that who generally think drinking tap water or drinking water in general is a waste of time. Like you don't need to do it. And that just fills me with dread. I cannot imagine being that person where it's like, mm, why would I drink a bottle of water? It's like, why would you drink a bottle of water? Why wouldn't you drink a bottle of water? It's flipping tasty. Um, so that's been my vibe at the moment. But hey, thankfully to be, I'm thankful that I'm in a situation I'm at the moment. So anyway, if you have a drink and you have a snack, grab yourself one and we're going to just dive right on in. Topic number one to get through and, and encouraging signs for myself, obviously, seeing as I'm going to be back outside painting the town red from June 21st going forward with all the clubs and bars and, you know, venues being allowed to open and introduce people with no social distancing measurements put into place. Well, obviously, the return to the dance floor is this encouraging news here, courtesy of BBC, which says the following. Uh, COVID Boris Johnson says England may need to wait may need to wait what to, to end restrictions or has it changed it didn't say that before oh man it said there's no restrictions needed okay let's, let's read it anyway so <laughs> i thought it just changed the headline it must have just changed now um so i said the following um Boris Johnson said um england may need to wait for the lifting of all covid restrictions in england which is currently planned for june 21st that is just diabolical considering that the rates of death are going down infections are going steady i'm assuming there's cases of new variants popping up here and there but i don't know what's happening with the government if they legitimately think that we're ever going to be in a situation where there's going to be we're never going to be in a society where we're going to live where covid is going to be eradicated it's just not going to happen it's just going to end up being one of those things that you know like the common cold where it's just going to um, exist and we're going to have to put together protocols procedures medical treatments whatever it may be to just make sure that people don't die as they were you know in previous years but in terms of coming you know in terms of just getting to a point where we're living in a zero covid world that just isn't that just isn't very um sensible really to think about it really it doesn't make any sense and again how long can you limit people's freedoms until you decide that, okay, maybe it's up to everybody else to decide how much risk they're willing to take on, right? Individually, because we've all been through a lot, especially people who have lost family members, right? I can just only imagine what they've kind of been through through this time, not being able to go and, you know, say your goodbyes, go to funerals, all that sort of stuff. Like, it's just horrendous, right? So if that's the case, I would just imagine there is a contingency of people that also just want to get on with their lives, right in whichever way it, it, it looks like whether it's moving out to the country whether it's going to hang out with your family whether it's just carrying on with life as per normal to give you something to get distracted with but people just want to i get the feeling get back to doing what they were doing in 2019 which is living i don't think people are in a position now where they want the government to basically eradicate a virus that's never going to be eradicated i would imagine so um, if it can, of course, you can try. But from everything I've read so far, it seems like to live in a zero COVID world just isn't something that is um, doable, really. Cause especially considering the country that we live in, right? Considering the amount of people that are coming in and out, right? Considering the amount of people that are going on holiday, um, considering that we're just a cultural hub, a tourism hub. It just seems improbable that we're ever going to get to a point where we can do 
zero COVID. We didn't close. We, we still haven't closed the borders, right? Like, I don't know what people, it, I don't know. This is really strange, but it continues. The PM said he saw nothing in the current day to suggest the government would have to delay. See, what? So why are you saying that, though? Boris Johnson said, um, we may need to wait for a lifting of all COVID restrictions in England. The PM also said he saw nothing currently in the data to suggest the government would have any delay in unlocking. So I don't know, just double, you know, just double speak is odd. But he said that there were signs of an increase in the number of cases in the Indian variant. It comes after the epidemiologist Professor Neil Ferguson again, shut up, man, this guy, said the reopening of society is now in the balance. On Thursday, a further 3,542 3, corona cases and 10 deaths within 28 days on the positive were reported in the UK. Over the last seven cases, over the last seven days, sorry, cases were up to... Oh, what am I stumbling my words? Over the last seven days, cases are up 20.5% compared to the week before. But that's the unfortunate case that's always been in the back of everyone's mind when we're dealing with COVID. We just had to... And no one kind of really went to address it. We have to get to a point where we started to think to ourselves, you know what? How much risk are you willing to take in order to kind of get... No, how many deaths are you willing to accept until people get back to living their normal lives? Because there has to be a number. Whether it's high or low, there's going to be a number where people feel, okay, this is enough deaths. But to get to zero is not probable. So what is your number? What is everyone's number? What's the government's number? They're going to have to figure that out because I don't think people are going to be happy with spending another summer locked indoors, especially with the rollout of the vaccine. People in my age group have suddenly started to get the vaccine, right? It's starting to get rolled out all over the gaff. Everyone's getting, I heard somebody in my social group who just got their first dose really recently, even got a text to go and get the second dose um, quite soon after because they want to just push everything through and get people as covered as they can. So there's definitely has to be a number where they're going to be like, you know what, this number is acceptable enough and it's an unfortunate place to be in. It's an unfortunate thing to say out loud, but there just has to be an end to this. There really needs to be an end, especially there needs to be an end as well that we don't need to keep turning back on. Non end where it's like, oh, another variant popped up. Like the other day I saw an article that said something about a um, a Thailand version of the of the virus. Now it's like, come on, man. Like, enough. These strains are always going to pop up. They're always going to come from densely populated places, right? It makes complete sense. Whatever, however they get, you know, sprung up these variants, whatever that happens to them, there needs to be some sort of understanding and acceptance that this is going to happen and we're going to have to just take the risks involved with it. Vaccine Shield. On June 21st, the government hopes to move to the final stage of its roadmap um, for lifting lockdown. Step four would see all legal limits on social contact removed. Nightclubs would reopen and restrictions on large events and performances would be lifted. Scientists advising the government are currently studying all relevant data since the last set of lockdown relaxations on 17th of May. It's been a long time still on it, right? to think about it like we june 25th like we've had like a basically more than a month in between each kind of lockdown thing that they've done as much as they can do i don't know what more people want man really to be completely honest speaking on the visit to a hospital this morning mr johnson said i think the question people want to answer is to what extent is our vaccine shield now going to be enough to allow us to go ahead with a june 21st with the unlocking now, as I've said many times, I don't see anything currently in the data to suggest that we should have to deviate from the roadmap, but we may need to wait. What does that mean? We don't need to deviate from the roadmap, but we need to wait. Does that mean a delay? Like, ah, oh, it's so confusing and annoying. The Prime Minister said that it was important to understand to what extent the vaccine program interrupts the link between the infection, hospitalization, serious illness and death. However, he reiterated that the vaccine is in use in the UK, works against the Indian variant, particularly with two doses. Um, there are early signs infection levels are rising. Like, okay, it's what he's saying, corresponding, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, let's see, man. Let's see what I'll go on. But I'm just ready and willing to get back onto a dance floor. I've had enough. I want to just go back out and rave again. This is not what I want to do with my life, staying indoors for so long, man. Not not really my vibe at all, bruv. So I can't wait to get back out there. I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Oh, yeah, that's it. There's this really cool article actually on Mixmag, which says the following I won't be sleeping. Nine ravers look forward to the return of clubbing, and I can definitely echo that. I will not be sleeping. We're not gonna sleep. Does that work? We're not gonna sleep. We're not gonna sleep anymore. On June 21st, 
We're not gonna sleep. We're not gonna sleep anymore. <laughs> Does that make sense? Oh, I gotta love it. Nine Ravens look forward to the return of clubbing. Um, Naim, what, how do you say that? Naima, right? Naima Ingram talks to members of the clubbing community ahead of the reopening of the nightclubs. Is there anything more yucky than being than being referred to as a clubbing community? Huh? It's a bit cringe, isn't it? But you know, you get the point. Clubbing community. We're a little group and we like to go clubbing. <laughs> We're really progressive and forward thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's continuous it says, June 21st could be about to go down in history as the date the third summer of love began under the government's current roadmap out of lockdown this is of course when the nightclubs will be allowed to reopen the UK's nightlife industry is worth a 66 billion pounds ultimately providing unique um, values and meanings to everyone their 15 month absence has left a gaping hole in the lives of many yuck gaping hole uh um just <laughs> just how keen are we to get back to the club spoiler alert berry the panel is you know a host of people all under the ages of 30 it looks like oh no we've got one old todger here the re mid 50s a dj everyone else is very fairly young to see what the youngsters have to say Question, what have you missed most about the club? Tom says, the social side, just being with my mates and having a good time. This year has been a diabolical, really, being at home constantly. Most of my mates are at uni, therefore I'm not really seeing them. So I haven't really missed that, but just having a good time, you know. Manji says, oh, so basically the atmosphere and the people, also the ability to listen to loud music and dance. The general release of dancing to loud music is definitely up there. Emily. All right, so um, the music, um, that's what first comes to mind. The opportunity to play or just to listen to it out loud and loud volume has been pending for so many months. And um, I've been going to Pirate Studios where you can make, rent out decks and just blast music really loud. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's been sand. Uh, besides that, just miss music in the clubs, the atmosphere, dancing. I cannot wait to get back at, back to it at all. What? Back to it all. I, I, I thought she said, I cannot wait to get back on it. <laughs> I was like, kudos, madam. Kudos. It could just go on as it's a loud accent. Malice says, um, I'd say being with my friends, looking around and just being together, very true. Just says the social element of it and meeting new people every night, the unpredictability in terms of what promoters, DJs and venues are capable of. The unpredictability, we don't really have much of that in England. That's one thing that's a bit annoying. There is nothing unpredictable about a UK club night. They're fairly formulaic and I'm speaking about it coming from a promoter having promoted club events in London for the best part of five years, five plus years, right? I definitely know that a lot of events are mostly formulaic because, you know, unfortunately, it's very difficult to make money as a promoter in London, especially with the competition around there. So if you actually want punters, you want people to come in and pay tickets and spend money in the bar, you have to book fairly well-known DJs that people know with, you know, uh, that can sell tickets, of course. And then usually that would then entail you having the same night as everybody else because the sound of your night is generally going to be dictated by the DJs you book. And mostly you're going to try and book DJs that kind of complement each other. Whereas I... When I was doing a night, special me, I would try to make the music or the people playing as different as possible, just so you could have a different offering of vibes, right? What I liked about, especially back in the day when it was like, when at work, it was not good. Well, working maybe in early days was a good example. One of the best sort of like R&B parties in the UK, especially in London, you know, early 2000s time, especially if you wanted to hook up with the girls, like all the hottest girls went to this place called Work It. And the great thing about it is that each DJ they booked usually had their own sort of personality and spin on what sort of hip hop and R and B um, party music they kind of liked, right? So you got all these different DJs coming up playing completely different things. It kind of gave a whole different vibe to the night, and it was like a direct sort of contrast to going to stuff like Living Proof and stuff like that, right? Or at places like Marketplace in West London, where it was a bit formulaic. It was a little bit the same old type of theme, kind of you know old school hip hop sort of style everyone playing a similar sort of music but when you went to work it you literally got an hour of everyone's basically playlist that they used when they work out and stuff right it's very very different so that's what i loved about it but over time that sort of a way of programming went 
out of style it feels like and now people mostly even if they're booking their friends they'll try to get people who will complement who the big ticket number person is on the lineup which is you know not the most adventurous thing doesn't necessarily cultivate a good scene doesn't necessarily cultivate a good community <laughs> right that word but you know what i mean isn't it it continues um he says josh what i used to enjoy most about the people dynamic is not knowing what to expect on each night out where's he going i know it's respect all the time you just read who's going to be on the flyer in it on the, on the lineup but what even when coming was a thing we could access very easily it felt like um every night was different and there was a limit of surprise so that's one of the biggest things for me just enjoying the diversity of in terms of lineup and what different places i've done okay fair enough maybe just experience simba at this rate i even miss queuing up for the toilets because Exactly. That's why I said on social the other day, I miss just being able to queue up. I miss, you know what I miss? I miss rocking up to the venues, um, you know, worried that you may have got there too late and the queue's too long, trying to act cool, like you're not checking out what the queue is saying, but also trying to keep you out of the front in case you spot someone that you know, and then realizing you don't know anybody because you're not cool. To, uh, trudging your way all the way back to the queue because obviously you did get there late and it's late now and then trying to be as calm cool and i've been here before but you're really freaking out like a little fangirl inside that's why i 100 percent miss for sure i 100 percent missed that nothing but nothing better or when you're too waved and off your nut and you're trying to act like you're not off your nut but at, when you're in the queue and you're trying to keep your composure so that security guard doesn't tell you to you know mind this one out and have a coffee and go home like all of that thing is amazing all of that is amazing um simba continues it's right i miss queuing in the toilets simba says um chats in the queue with random people before later seeing them on the dance floor is so funny you feel like you're friends for life but you've only just seen them in the queue exactly yeah that hug hey what's happening you got in it's like you know what i mean it's like it's so stupid it's like you got in yes congrats man you found it you did it you did it they somehow allowed you to exchange your money for entry into a club where they play loud music in a dark room wow congratulations i'm so proud of you <laughs> the simplest thing is that um i used to moan about the these things that i missed the most now exactly i think the time is you know what i also missed the most out of standing at a bar behind people hoping to get a drink and people are you know, uh, stealing, jumping in in front of you, uh, pretending they're talking to their friends, but they're not. And then they jump in front of you that way. Bartenders ignoring you. Like, oh, I love that. I love that. Or, you know, or you thinking you're the special one that should get the attention of the bartender. The bartender realizing that you're up your own ass and then purposely missing you out to teach you a lesson. Miss that. <laughs> Continue. I think the theme throughout it is just meeting people randomly and having a 30 minute friendship, which probably end nowhere. But at that time, you feel like you can't have the month's worth of chat with the person and consider them a friend for life. Of course, you get them, man. Especially when you're off your nut, you're in a, in a smoking area, you lost something, you're trying to find your friends, you find some new friends, and your friends have new friends, and you make a group, and then suddenly those people disappear, and it's just you and your friend, and then you're out there. Ah! It continues. Um, a number of things I've missed generally meeting up with people. AI says AI or owl. And for me, I run nights as well as playing in the um with them in the band, the Reem, the general camaraderie with people. Um has been the main thing though. You can obviously argue wages and everything, but I just think people getting together and having a good time. You see the common theme here. No one's really talking about the music because you can listen to music everywhere. And fortunately, we'd had We've had like a great resurgence in live streams. Basically, every DJ, every DJ under, under the sun, with maybe the exception of Ricardo Villalobos, has done a DJ live stream. Even Solomon did one, right? And he's been playing, you know, quasi play gravy things allegedly all over the world throughout this entire time. And he still managed to do a live stream. But um, with those live streams, obviously, we've been able to hear loads of music and whatever it may be. But what we've basically missed out on is that, you know, ability to party in a place with loads of different people from all walks of life that sort of like shared kinship whatever it may be that's what we really missed out on do you know what i mean that's what oh my, 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 my sound's going off but that's what we really missed out on we missed out on all that stuff and that's why i can't wait to get back on like just and that's the main thing people don't really realize about clubbing in it part of it is the most important part of it is the quote-unquote community <laughs> That's the important part of it. Being on a dance floor with strangers, rubbing shoulders, right? The throb, the wave of people, you know, moving side to side as you're getting to, the, as you're coming up to the dance floor, seeing everyone's back dancing, eyes closed, hands in the hair. Like, man, man. Continues, Peter. 
He says he misses the fun, the potential of a night out, you know. It's just what we all work for, the same thing. We love to dance and it's the fun and engagement with other people. We've been robbed of that. I miss the excitement, the butterflies. For us, when we do gigs, the clubs, we get real adrenaline rush. And these days, that's as close to a class A as we can get being in our mid 50s yeah definitely true and let's see exactly for sure tete says i've missed interactions with people the most i think and um, what we've missed in quarantine life is just those interactions whether it's just fleeting chatting with somebody in the toilets or talking to someone in the walkway those little moments of sparks of communication i miss those so much yeah man i miss them as well man the, the amount of new friends you add on instagram and you add on facebook and stuff and you just share war stories and whatever it may be like it's just amazing you know what the best thing is when you meet somebody in a rave you have an amazing little bromance and then you bump into them at another rave that has nothing to do with what you played, what you saw them at prior. Like, oh my God, not only do we like the same music at that place, we're also into the same sort of artist or stuff that we had to go to. It blows your mind. Like there's nothing better than like, you know, meeting somebody in a warehouse or somewhere in London and then I'm in Berlin somewhere and I bump into them. It's like, no way, this is flipping mad right it's so so random especially on the days given and the places i go to blah 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 blah. it's always a great experience man so this is a pretty cool feature i love this look at all these pictures like oh i can't wait to see happy strangers on the dance floor smiling having a good time and um, what you're looking forward to when the clubs reopen so i'm mostly looking forward to clubbing out of my area i turned 18 in january so i managed to go clubbing about two or three times at salisbury da, da, da. okay manji misses being able to perform again performs a big chunk of part of my job uh emily says i'm feeling of togetherness with everybody and Myla says the excitement and the buzz that i've compared to um compared to pre-covid just to celebrating people who've done so well to keep it going simba says seeing what people have been creating oh that's true in it imagine dude but i wonder if that actually did happen though because a part of me thinks especially if you haven't been able to play any play graves and you legitimately haven't been able to make any money like, I, I don't know if you're really going to be that inspired to be creating at this moment. You obviously should because they say, you know, great creativity or great works of art come from the, you know, worst times of your life, right? When you're actually going through real existential pain, that's when usually you can channel that stuff into your creative work and you make some of the best, most poignant work you've ever made. It might not sound good to you, but other people can feel viscerally, right, what you are going through um, via the music that you're making or the artwork that you're creating. But I wonder if people did that during COVID because it's been such a long drawn out process. There's been so many ebbs and flows, right? So many false dawns. We have this Dominic Cummings flipping, um, you know, thing. Was it Cummings? Yeah, Cummings thing recently. Is it Cummings or Hancock? Whichever one it was. The bald one that looks like a bit of a, the, the, the one that looks like a, uh, a bald baby eagle. That guy, right? He's talking to a flipping panel, giving, you know, basically letting us all know that Boris did a really crappy job in terms of handling COVID and all that malarkey. So we've all been through some really tough times during this moment, right? I wonder if some of the creators of the world of producers have actually been making music. I wonder. I'm not really too sure, to be honest. Everyone going to give it their rule. There were going to be a healthy competition with Amazing Nights. That'll be going off. It'll be interesting to see how these testings work where people go into, getting drunk people to get to sword before they in. It'll be funny. I don't know if that meant, uh, if that if that's been uh, fought through. But yeah, I'm not really too sure about the whole idea that it's all, there's going to be a lot of competition and stuff. Maybe in the first opening nights. But I think overall, I think people are going to be surprised with how, I wouldn't say dead it will be, but especially when it settles down and the kind of the dust settles, the people that are going to be on the dance floor are going to be the ones that are always going to be on the dance floor. I think the general punters are going to be maybe i wouldn't say stay away but they've maybe just moved on to other things i think people are going to be in for a rude awakening there might be a bit of a time where in the first two weeks maybe the first month after lockdown the revs are popping off again but it's going to level off pretty sharply i think which is why you're seeing a lot of these later festivals that have been going on have been slowly but surely not selling out in record times as they were previously. I think people are going to be in for a rude awakening. That's my own belief, but I'm not too sure if that's true. Um, uh, Al says being back to how it was uh, would be the best thing. Whether that happens or not is a different matter, of course, but I think the smaller, the similar to the first question really is meeting up with people, blah, blah, blah. Let's continue. How often do you think you'll go to the clubs when they reopen? Tom says at the start, probably most days, I've been such a long to wait to initially definitely 
so oh, it, it's such a long wait so initially definitely most weekends after that it depends on the bank balance really clubs are expensive so it all depends exactly everyone's been out of work everyone's been you know not being able to make a steady amount of income especially if you've been working in the events or hospitality industry you've just got back on your feet now so splurging all your money especially since you've been saving so much money being at home being able to i don't know if people's i don't know whether you're the same but i still haven't got a haircut yet right and that's just because my habits have changed i've not really needed to go anywhere um why would i get a haircut now spending 20 quid i'm like Ugh. do you know what I mean so my sensitivity to spending money is definitely heightened since lockdown i'm not sure if the people are the same so i don't know if people are going to be willing to splurge on 20 15 pound tickets to go places all the time i don't know it continues probably every weekend manji says in one way or another i feel like i've been robbed of so much time and there's so much music and dancing i've got to do i'm definitely going to be out when they're out when we're allowed here for sure yeah that's that's definitely another one isn't it getting your dance floor endurance back up again because that's a whole different level of endurance similar to like you know if you if you've ever been running and then you played football or you played like an actual sport you realize that there's a difference between being able to do a 10k and actually being able to keep up with people doing a five aside at power league or something right it's a different level of fitness so it's the same thing that goes for like you know being a good tourist right being able to be on your feet all day and walk around a city that you're going to travel in same goes for being on a dance floor there's a different level of endurance required that's sort of like situational and also something that you only kind of get when you're on the dance floor week in week out so all this time we've been without it i think a lot of us are going to be a very um we're going to be a lot there's going to be a lot of out of breath people on the dance floor let me tell you that a lot of people kind of taking breaks and staying to the side and then coming back in again i definitely envision that one emily said as often as i can be gigs are starting to roll in Madison says every day as you won't see me i won't be sleeping maybe not four or three times a week realistically but definitely in the weekend a lot more than previously Everyone in their own heads thinks it's non-stop. I feel like it will be, it will be like that at least from the start. See, just the same thing. I'm saying I'll be hoping to go as much as I can. It will just be so good to be there. I hope that people will have an appreciation for it. Oh yeah, hopefully people don't go out and start flipping, asking their mates they're putting on nights for guest lists and stuff as well. Don't be a knob. Do you know what I mean we've all? Everyone's been without money. Everyone's been without work for ages. Don't then go and start asking for guest lists. Buy a ticket like everybody else is buying. Queue up and go. Like leave people alone. Do you know what I mean? Like it's gonna be such a hard, difficult time to manage these things and these events and uh, uh, make sure that they go off without a hitch and all this malarkey because a lot's riding on this right um no one wants to be in a position where they open them up and then they close them back again like it was bad enough they did that with the gyms earlier i, I can't handle it if they did that with the flipping nightclub so let's just you know let's all behave but act like act like some semi-adults and grown-ups and go from there as a DJ, Simba says, I'm hoping to go out a lot more than I play. Granted, a lot of the venues have shut down, but I could play every day for two months after places open. I would, I would. Um, but if I could, okay, I'll play every day. I've been storing up so many new songs. There's a lot to discover in the year period. Now that I've had so many years, uh, than last year, I've forgotten about things I listened to last April to go through an entire catalog of songs required for me to be playing a lot of parties. So I'll be going out a lot anyway. So yeah, loads of really good um, things on there, questions and stuff. I'll let you read the rest of it. It's a pretty long article, but it's basically called uh, Nine Ravers Looking Forward to the Return of Clubbing. I'll pop it uh, in the show notes so you can read it yourself. It's a fairly good expose, I thought. Fairly, fairly good one. Ah, oh, anyway, let's just continue. Let's just continue. What's he got here? Oh, yeah, let's move on to this, actually. Let's go on to this. This is pretty distressing news, courtesy of The Telegraph, concerning my team, Manchester United, and our coach or manager, Oli Gunnar Solskjaer, which says the following. My night looked to back Oli Gunnar Solskjaer with new contract despite Europa League final loss. Ed Woodward, who I thought had left his post at United, who'd kind of seeped past his new and, you know, tucked his tail between his legs and ran off. But somehow he's still calling the shots and deciding things like new contract, which just says everything he needs to know about United. But it says Edward to reward the manager despite defeat and will spearhead United's summer transfer plans ahead of his exit in December. So he's exiting in December, making one last final. He's leaving, he's leaving us with one um, last final cupcake which is basically giving Ole Gunnar Solskjaer like a three-year contract, which is just typical of United, isn't it? Absolutely typical, man. Since the following, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer will be um, backed with a new contract in, and the summer signings in the transfer market, spearheaded by an ongoing executive, outgoing, sorry, executive vice chairman, Ed Woodward, despite Manchester United finishing the season without a trophy. United is disappointed 
in the Europa League final this week, but the campaign is seen by the club's board as progress, which is frightening. After finishing second in the Premier League and reaching their first final under Solskjaer, the Norwegian 48, which is, you know, still didn't win two previous semifinals, got, didn't win either. So it doesn't really count for anything, in my opinion, but we continue. The Norwegian 48 has one um, season left on his current deal and will open talks over a free extension. He will also be supported with up to four signings to bolster this squad in an attempt to close the gap with champions Manchester City. Now, on the face of it, of course, this is terrible news. I think we've just learned now in the morning, as I'm reporting this, that Andrea Pirlo, the manager of Juventus and obviously ex-Juventus legend, has now been sacked from his post at Juventus as head coach. He finished the season in fourth place, I'm assuming, on the last Champions League place in the Serie A. Also finished the season with a trophy, but after a year, Juventus deemed that not to be acceptable enough in order for them to get back to where they need to get to, so they've made a change. The early suggestions is that um, Allegri is going to come back and manage at Juventus again so that might be one of them or another option but you know big teams doing big things so it's really funny the contrast of seeing United you see United a club that does everything their own way and also gets it wrong right so we kind of want to do things our own way and kind of move to the beat of our own drum and uphold these standards and traditions and whatever it may be which for the most part were only created during Sir Alex Ferguson's you know, most successful period at the club. It's not as if these things have been embedded within the DNA of Manchester United, right? It's just insane. But anyway, they use terms like DNA, cultural reset and all that sort of nonsense. And you look at what we're doing and we're doing the complete opposite of everybody else. We've just only recently hired a director of football who has been at the club since, you know, um, David Moyes was there. So I'm not really sure what change we're expecting there. He's also got an assistant who is Darren Fletcher, who has no experience of working in a job. So we've hired all these amateurs and people who have not really pulled up any trees whilst they're at the club to do a very important part of what modern day football clubs are about. Um, and yeah, on the face of it, it just is really bad. I guess if you look at it and kind of step, take a step back, this is quite in line with what United do. Whenever anyone, whether it's a coach or a player, has only a year left on their contract, we tend to kind of automatically renew just so we can cover our backs, I guess, which I don't really know what is going on here because it's not as if you know, another big club is going to come and try and prize Oli away from us. He's a pretty mediocre football coach. I think most people can agree on. He might be world-class and he's man-managing what he's done with Luke Shaw, what he's done with Paul Pope in terms of getting him settled, what he did for the early parts with Martial, what he did for the early parts with um, his experience with Rashford, um, McTominay's kind of grown into another play underneath him. Obviously, Bruno Fernandes signing. He's done some obviously great things, but mostly in terms of the man management side of things. I think a lot of the players, if you spoke to them one by one in private, off the record, I think they'd argue the same. But in terms of coaching, in terms of actually getting those players to play above their level within a system that brings out maybe the best and some of the worst of players, I don't think he's necessarily going to do that or ever will be able to do that. We've ever seen... We've even seen in most recent interviews that he says something along the lines of like, oh, I'm not the coach. I leave that to other people in the coaching stuff. I'm more of a man manager. He's even said that himself, right? So if that's the case, we and we are a club that doesn't necessarily spend a lot of money on a lot of players. We might spend a lot of money on two of two of players, right? Marquee one, maybe one. But we're not exactly going to go out and sign the four to six players that we need, maybe four first team players and maybe the other two can be players that can fill in the squad. But we definitely need four first team players to come in and challenge and maybe stake a claim for their starting role in the, in the starting lineup in order for us to have any semblance of an opportunity to challenge, you know, amazing clubs like Man City who are run very well compared to us from top to bottom who have a supreme coach, who have unlimited funds with their owners. Obviously, with you know some you know maybe not so desirable methods of get attaining their wealth but still they have a far better avenue and option to do so than we do so it's looking a bit worrying i got business it's looking very very worrying of how we've kind of rewarded what looks like fate what, what what looks like progress we've actually rewarded failure in my opinion but hey we continue it says Jaden sancho is also a primary target as a wide forward which is key position to strengthen the united manager would also like a striker a, a young central midfielder and a defender if anybody legitimately thinks that we're going to improve the st our football is going to improve in any meaningful way with the signing of Jaden Sancho, United fan, you really need to give your head a wobble. Our problems go far deeper than just signing a Jaden Sancho. If anything, I would argue we would probably be doing a Jaden Sancho a disservice long term by signing him at United given our current turmoil. It doesn't make any sense. Like, 
none of our players make sense. If you sign a Jaden Sancho, you can't have Jaden Sancho playing in front of Luke Shaw or Aaron wan They're not good enough, right? You need fullbacks who are good enough on the ball and technically to bring out the best in those sort of wingers. Just imagine the horror shows that we're going to see wing play between Jaden Sancho and Aaron wan -Bissaka. Like, it's just too bad. Really, really bad. So there needs to be a complete overhaul with how we kind of play the game. And even in terms of our ball, ball playing centre backs, like none of them, maybe with the exception of maybe Lindelof, maybe Harry Maguire on a good day, you would call ball playing centre backs, right? They, they, they kind of can play on the ball because they're professional football players, but they're not going to exactly progress the play. So we're going to need a number six to come from deep, collect the ball from the centre backs and then spread it up the pitch. Who's that young centre defender midfielder going to be? Declan Rice? You think we're going to sign Jaden Sancho, Declan Rice, a defender and a midfielder? Or oh, well, De Jaden Sancho and, De uh, and Declan Rice and a striker? Do you honestly think that's going to happen after we just signed um, Elisa Cavani to a new deal? It makes no sense. Jaden Sancho alone, even with this, you know, depreciated market in the COVID era, um, you know, Dortmund now know we're desperate, having been, you know, embarrassed in the Europa League final against Villarreal, seventh, league, seventh you know, place finished uh, team in the La Liga and stuff. They're going to still want to put us over a barrel in terms of the pricing for Jaden Sancho. It's not like we're going to get him for like 20 million. We're still going to pay north of 70 for him. So we, you think we're definitely going to get Jaden Sancho and Declan Rice in one window? I doubt that very much. But if we do, that's going to be our only two signings. And do you think with the addition of Jaden Sancho and Declan Rice that we can legitimately close the gap between Man City? I still think we're going to go into next season trying to finish in the top four. I don't think top four is a, is a given. I think this season was such a weird one, was such a one-off that I don't think it's ever going to be replicated, especially with the lack of fans really affected maybe some teams, especially our away record was maybe greatly influenced by the lack of fans in the stadium. But Arsenal are going to come good. I reckon after another, you know, disappointing year with Arteta in charge, for sure Tottenham are going to improve if they end up hiring Conte. That's going to take them to a whole nother level. Liverpool, of course, are going to come good again. Chelsea, of course, are going to do what Chelsea do and compete. Man City are going to do what they've always done and compete and probably win again. Can we legitimately say that we're even going to be challenging Man City? I'd say we're going to be challenging and fighting for our lives to get into a top four, especially with um, Champions League football. Right, like I would with with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's reluctance reluctance to rotate the squad or rotate the starting eleven. There's going to be a lot of tired players playing week in, week out. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be pretty. I guarantee you that. Bruce Dortmund understands to be desperate to sell in the summer to raise money. It says while a list of United offloads could be headed to a potential sale uh, of either David Gea or Dean Henson, with both goalkeepers understood to be unhappy with the prospect of starting next season as second choice. That's an odd one with the goalkeeper one, isn't it? It doesn't really make any sense. We gave De Gea a bumper contract where he's on like five, three hundred and fifty mil, or three hundred fifty thousand per week plus. Then we gave An uh, Dean Anderson a contract like he's a you know number one goalkeeper. Then we rotated them all season. Solskjaer did, wasn't sure which one actually worked. Didn't want to stick with one just you know for the long term. De Gea plays the Europa League final. So if you're De Gea, what do you think? Do you think you're going to be number one? Probably. There's probably not a lot of suitors for De Gea when he does leave United anyway because you know he's older and he's going to cost a lot of money. He's got to take a pay cut in some extent. United don't like offloading players without getting anything back in return even if the player is, you know, past their sell-by date. It's still going to be an interesting season going forward. Sancho 21 was a target a year ago, but a deal could not be struck with Dortmund, who refused to lower the price point of £108 million. Pounds. The England forward expected to leave um, the West, how do you say that? West Fallon Stadion. The, uh, leave West Fallon Stadion this summer with a lower fee and his social like his first choice as a wide forward. Aston Villa's Jack Grealish is a big one. Is a mile by United, but bringing Sancho back to England is social like preference, yeah. But I'd, I'd definitely go for a Jack. If you pick a Jack Grealish, that's definitely going to cause a bit of upset in the fan base because Jack Grealish on current form is miles better than a Marcus Rashford. Like, you know, I'd bench Rashford for a Grealish in a heartbeat. Without even blinking an eyelid. I'd bench Grealish for flipping. I'd bench Bruno for Grealish without a heartbeat, but I don't think he operates that well in the centre. I think he's probably best coming on for the wings. 
Um, it continues the market has been altered by Harry Kane wanting to leave, but they only be expected to fight to keep the England captain. United would like to bring in a young central midfielder in, in the mold of Rend Edward Camavinga, but it will be a player for the future rather than to make an immediate impact. That and other businesses will be conducted according to United's transfer by committee policy, one of which will be headed by Woodward. How is he still making decisions football when he's going to leave anyway? God almighty. Despite him reigning in the wake of his last European Super League debacle, Woodward would remain in the help of United's transfer plans for the longest as he position at the club's executive vice chairman with the departure plan for the end of 2021. United's group managing director Richard Arnold is widely expected to succeed Woodward, maintaining the club's policy of promoting from within, but it's not currently part of the transfer committee that includes commercial experts such as Matt Judge, director of negotiation Cliff Batty. Who the hell is that? Chief financial officer. Judges, um, <laughs> judges the United's chief negotiator on the financial side of transfers, although the Glazers of Via Woodward have already always maintain their hands-on approach and have always final say so on the deal the committee includes so look how many people it takes to sign the plane no wonder we're in oh my god man we're in shambles man we do everything opposite of how the top sides do but then we expect top size results we ha want to have patience with a coach that clearly isn't good enough we want to i don't know man we have a committee of people too many of people that probably have no footballing knowledge or aren't quote unquote footballing people. Oh my god, the committee includes social Mike, uh, sister Mike Feeling. What's Mike Feeling doing there? John Murto, the newly appointed um, director of football at Old Trafford, and technical director Dan Fletcher, who offers insights into United's academy and how emergency lets inform transfer business, as well as the representative of United Scouting Department. But for as long as it remains in the post, Woodward will oversee the transfer activity, partly in order to affect a smooth handover if expected, as his friend Arnold steps into the shoes. His friend. Oh, Solskjaer had admitted that he would not dream the steam the season to be successful without the victory against Villarreal on Wednesday. And in the fallout of the marathon penalty shootout defeat, he has um, he has other squad issues to deal with. Oh God, oh my Donny van der Beek and his other stuff. So yeah, you get the deal, and you get the gist. <sighs> I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. What can you do? Let's move on from that one because it's bumming me out. It really is. And we're back. Sorry about that. I had a bit of a power outage on my side of things, but you know, we're back ready to roll. Apologies, apologies. If you're watching via YouTube, you probably should see some change um, in the video and stuff. If you're listening via audio, you will see no change. In case you're wondering, get some drinking water. Last bottle of the week. Banged it out, mate. Six bottles, all one week. Way! Actually, not even one week, actually, isn't it? That's like, what? Five days crazy isn't it absolutely crazy i'm a water drinking machine what else do we have here what else do we have here okay next on list oh we have this interesting stuff courtesy of hype beast pleasures ada superstar collaboration is designed for changing moods um off the bat I like the look of them, of course, because they're all black. If you know anything about me, you know I love all black shoes, especially with the, you know, contrasting accents or something that just pops off, right? Whether it's, you know, this sort of like iridescent stripes, whether it's a white lines, whether it's, um, no, so whether it's iridescent stripe, white lines, a contrasting swoosh, different stitching. But in terms of the base, I love an all black shoe. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's from, you know, spending too many years in school. <laughs> um, or maybe it's kind of the area that I grew up in, but there's something about all black trainers or with predominantly all black base. Like I think of the Jordan 4 breads. Those are probably one of my favorite colors of any sneaker of all time. That color is a classic. It works. It's probably the only kind of mostly black colorway that can work with really light jeans, that can work with a white pair of jeans, right? That can work with shorts, that can work with combat pants, chinos. It's just such a versatile color. I don't know why it is. Don't ask me why. Maybe the same people have the same sort of feelings towards stuff like white stan smiths and white air force ones but for me all black sneakers bs that is this stance so when i see these pleasure superstars uh, right pleasure superstars I'm, I'm like instantly gravitate towards them but then i do honestly remember there was a time in my life where i tried to be the ada superstar boy um during a very brief period when i used not brief period but during a very pivotable moment when i was in church 
is that pivotal or pivotal pivotal moment in my life when i used to go to church quite often a lot of the boys i used to hang around with at the time used to love wearing either stan smiths and the idea back in the days was to wear stan smith with like boot cut jeans and like a really nice designer shirt right and at the time for some reason people like to also have the tongue be a little bit puffy so what they would do is that they would get another sock fold it and then put it into kind of insert it into the top of the sock they're already wearing so you got a little lump on the top of your foot and then you wore those and that'll make the tongue puff out a bit experts like myself would sometimes get that sock and kind of stitch it or glue it to the back of the actual tongue but sometimes it would move around so the best thing to do is to get a really tight sock and then put that sock inside of a sock and then have that kind of thing popping off but unfortunately my feet are long i wear a size 10 euro 44 40 44 45 and maybe my right foot is like a 10.5 so i always have a bit of problems but the main thing that's my big problem is that i have a really wide aka fat foot so when it comes to sneakers like an either superstar with this very narrow toe box towards the front that really points up it's sort of similar to like a um a football sneaker it's really lights out for me. It can't work. And I love them. It's probably one of my favorite silhouettes all, all, all around. I remember having a really great time wearing them when I was in school. And like I said, um, when I was in church, they were like the... They were as good as Prada sneakers back in the day, like all white ones with like the black stripes. I think people used to get them from Foot Look at the time or JD Sports. There's a little hang tag that hang with them that you would hang on the side. You'd kind of cross out, you'd kind of tie them and kind of skip loads of lace hoops. So you kind of go maybe from the bottom all the way to the top, like eyelet, sorry. That was such a great shoe, really, really great shoe. But unfortunately now in an era where I like, you know, I kind of... Um, Maybe because you get older, I kind of prioritize having comfortable shoes over having shoes that look very stylish. But unfortunately, nowadays, the most stylish shoes or the most, yeah, the most stylish shoes aren't very comfortable. So you kind of have to do this. And I think I learned my lesson with my um, Balenciaga Triple S's, which I basically hardly ever wear. And I spent a lot of money on them, right? I've got the original black pair, the black and red pair, kind of basically the bread, the bread pair. And I just can't wear them too often because, unfortunately, I got a size 44 because my they were, the 45s were too big. They were basically like a, a standard UK 11 and they were way too big. And, of course, the triple S's are, you know, super f fat elephant foot of a shoe. So I thought, let me get the 44s and take out the insole, which usually works out pretty well for me. I got them, they're fine. But the is it, yeah, no, it's not my right foot, it's the left foot. My left foot with the flipping extra bunion on my pinky toe and just the general width of my, you know, my forefoot. Yeah, that's it. My forefoot's really wide. It's just so annoying, man. Maybe because I was kind of... I've kind of fixed it now with a lot of squatting and a lot of, like, foot mobility workouts. But when I was younger, I was really flat-footed. So that might be a reason why as well. Like, my, my feet kind of splay out that way. So when it comes to wearing, like, narrow shoes, like anything with a van, like a Vans or, like, a Converse and stuff, I always have to kind of go half a size up just to kind of accommodate for that little bit of wiggle room at the front when need be. Obviously, when I wear them, often enough, that kind of toe box area does kind of stretch out a little bit. But when you first get them, the pain is excruciating. Excruci 18 but these are really nice man i'm not going to lie all black uppers with the sort of iridescent um stripes on the side um they're not an ada superstar 80s it looks like maybe they are but it doesn't look like it because they've got a little bit of padding on the heel there maybe if i'm not mistaken the padding on the heel does usually um maybe it's not maybe because the padding usually it's a padding on on the heel bit and also like little metal hoops on the eyelids usually are an indication that they're not 80s but the shape does look really fairly nice for it to be a just a standard gr the shape is really nice and it? it's like a flat silhouette but to be honest that's what one thing adas have really smashed nike on when it comes to retros they've really done a good job in terms of getting the original tooling the original molds or maybe just sorry rebuilding them from the ground up because i remember that was a big thing people used to always stay connected with nike which was always a lie they would chat so much shit nike but they always have us over a barrel ready and willing to kind of you know do anything to get their sneakers but i remember back in the day when i used to go and crooked tongues a lot and used to be surrounded by all those sneakerheads and they kind of had a bit of infant information they used to always say the reason why nike would ruin retros like i think of like the air max light which is still another tragedy in terms of the air max um range and shoes what nike did to it and how it came out vis-a-vis -vis how it originally originally was released they said the reason why it looked so horrible and they had that weird bananas foot thing and the paneling on the upper was all messed up was because they hadn't 
they didn't have the original tooling and um, the original molds that they basically made the Air Max light with, right? And to make it from scratch, supposedly it costs like a million to make like a mold of a shoe. And I guess you'd have to iterate it out in terms of a mold for a shoe, then per size. I don't know, whatever, however you manufacture or make a shoe to make the original mold just costs a lot of money. And they used to say that back in the day. And I remember thinking, hold on, Nike make billions, right? They probably make at least like half a million. No, they probably make, they, I'd, I'd imagine they make maybe close to half a million on just the sales of Air Force Ones worldwide alone. So how are they now kind of trying to justify and say, oh, the reason why we can't make a good retro or a retro that's kind of, um, you know, that sort of lends itself to the original that when it originally, to the original that came out is because they can't make the tooling again. It's like, huh? That doesn't make any sense. They make, they legitimately are able to make shoes out of like recycled bits of newspaper. And you're telling me that they can't retool a base of a model. So that's where I thought, you know what? I just really smashed them in that part because they took their retros really seriously when it comes to the campus, when it comes to the Stan Smith, when it comes to the um, S Superstar, when it comes to the Forum, when it comes to the ZX series, like they've always, there's always they've always said, okay, if we're going to do a collaboration, and we're gonna you know we're gonna go to these sneakerheads and tell them hey you need this zx 700 which you probably have 50 million in your flipping collection we're gonna make it worth their while we're gonna improve the materials we're gonna make the shape as true to the original as possible and we're gonna keep the numbers actually limited so when you know and unlike unlike with nike or with that way unlike with like with nike i think adidas and new balance do a good job of it like if you actually buy a limited edition adidas or new balance you feel as if it's limited edition like you can't usually find it readily available anywhere else where it feels like with nike they put out a limited edition shoe you've got all these sneaker resets on instagram standing in front of stacks of shoes that look like they're in a the stockroom somewhere all around the world right it's not just one kid it's like million of kids all around the states basically it's all around the states that have somehow are able to get whole shoe runs of shoes then all the retail uh, partners that they have who also have the shoes. Then all the influencers. You're like, hold on. How limited are these really? Are they limited or are you just limiting where they sold at? They're not exactly limited though, are they? they I mean, that's the actual stipulation that they put in. And then later on down the line, they didn't decide to just, you know, completely, you know, um, squeeze that limited edition uh, range dry. Look at the Travis Scott collection. And it did Nike are just not stopping with the amount of shoes they're putting out um, with Travis Scott's name attached to it. So at least with Adidas, if you do get a, a shoe, collaboration with ADS, especially stuff like this like a pleasure shoe it's probably not gonna be the most popular shoe out there in the world pleasures is probably a little bit of a niche core sort of like streetwear brand it's may maybe some people don't like it but still it kind of you know maybe has a very small niche so only a small amount of people are gonna buy it you know you purchased this not a lot of people are gonna have it and it is what it is but the nike shoes is like they're limitless mate it's legitimately limitless so if you've got the money and the funds you can basically get any shoe you want from nike regardless of when it came out any shoe you can get it brand new in your size like it's pretty insane if you think about it legitimately like it means like what most people that buy nikes don't wear them or they just make too many of the shoe and they lie to you about the quantity who knows but regardless i quite like these pleasures um ada superstars again i'm not too sure if they're in 80s i think they're probably not yeah, all black with basically a translucent sole that says pleasures on the bottom the only thing i don't like about pleasures which i've got to be honest about is the font on the of the logo like, it just looks too, like, defaunty. I guess it is a, a probably just a, a basic uh, font, stock font, I think you could get, maybe with a few tweaks here and there, but it just looks so, like, Times New Roman-ish. That's the only slight I would say about pleasures. Like, that's why I wouldn't necessarily wear, like, a logo hoodie of theirs with the kind of name splayed in the front of it. It just looks a little bit amateurish. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I've never really liked the font. But in terms of what they put out there, in terms of their collaboration, in terms of some of their art direction, like, it's always top-notch. Uh, the, the, let's read a bit of text here it says um, taking on the classic footwear model the Los Angeles label uh, dressed the shoe in black smooth leather accompanied with a matching show toes uh, the, the, the translucent free stripes branding on the sole is um, can be customized to fit the changing moves of a tiny reusable interchangeable pattern inserts what of the sole of the insole they mean oh no of the actual stripes you can change the stripes inserts so it's not it's not um, iridescent okay interesting why do you do that um, let's read that again. But the translucent free stripes branding on a shoe can be customized to fit the changing moods with 10 reusable interchangeable patterns. I don't like the mood thing. That sounds like a mood ring and a mood bracelet and all that malarkey. That's a little bit G-A-Y, but hey, we continue. Insert design range from animal prints, plaid, tie-dye and gradient patterns, flames and graphic displays. Additional branding elements come in the form of the pleasures printed on the red, rubberized marking in the rear and Adidas dossing on the heels. Elevating the shoe, uh, the back mid, are uh, the 
are black midsoles paired with translucent rubber tra outsoles uh, with uh, that obscure pleasures logo underneath. That's pretty cool. So you can change the actual straps on the outside. Is it cool? Isn't? I don't think it's that cool, really. It's a little bit, mm, it's a little bit naff to be honest, isn't it? So I guess that pleasures is what does that does that double up as the e in the name with the little free shirts that you can just slot in there or whatever it may be. I don't know. That sounds a little bit. Yeah, I'm not really a fan of the little inserting things. It's, it's what what next are they gonna make flipping wheelies? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Black shoe I'm a fan of. The inserts on the side, not so much. But hey, we can't win anything. We can't win everything. Next on the sneaker front, we have an announcement courtesy of Hypebeast about the new Fragment Design Nike Dunk Highs. Now, I've said previously before that I am not a big fan of Dunks. I think they're basically the budget version of an Air Force One. I think if you want that silhouette and if you want that paneling, you're better off just getting a Jordan One or getting an Air Force One. They're far superior shoes. They just look better on the feet. I've always maintained that there's something about the Dunks, maybe the retros, maybe not the originals. They actually come out when? Is it 80s, 70s, whenever they did come out? But there's something about the overall shape of them that just doesn't sit right when you actually put them on your feet. They don't look that too bad when you actually put them on the shelf. But then when you have them on your feet, they look terrible. And of course, these product shots are disgusting. They didn't actually... The lacing job they did is terrible. They're not laced properly. They're laced too tight. They lace like how, um you know, Marquise... What's his name? MK, Marquise Fingamajiggy, MKBHD from that tech channel, how he laces his Jordan 1s. You know, it's just a crime against humanity how he you know, absolutely strangle those bad boys all the way up to the top. Um, so they don't look that great with the lacing, but there's something about how they look and even the quality on here. Like, th this is why sometimes I understand why people get reps. Like I said, I'm rep fan for life. If I can't buy my stuff from retail and enter with the you know, retail, if I can't enter a raffle and have the opportunity, you know, to purchase a shoe with my hard earned money, then I, I'm just going to go rep. I don't give a crap in it because I've, I've been in this game for too long to be denied shoes because, you know, a, a bunch of bots on Discord are buying them up and stuff. I don't want to get involved in that game but look at the quality of this even this product shot right it's on hype piece look at all the all the creasing and the leather like that doesn't look like good leather to me not sure about you but that looks a little bit cheap that looks like a foot because usually there is a i don't know what the lay a level is that's not really true because i would say gr but not all grs are made equal some grs have really good leather in them but for some reason when it goes to like mainstream athletic stores like you know or sorry sporting goods stores like footlocker or jd sports whatever it may be they usually have nike shoes that have this sort of leather in it on them um where it's sort of like plasticky um it's just it sort of creases really easily like you just touch it and it's already creasing really badly and if you know anything about you know wearing brand new shoes the last thing you want is to your shoes to look like you've been wearing them for 10 days when you've only just got them uh, eventually they're going to crease up and get battered and bruised but you don't want them to look instantly bad because of the cheap leather but they just look a bit cheap right the leather don't you think so maybe it's just me but this is why look even the finishing here on some of the cuts and panels and seams and stuff it's just all a bit crappy do you know what i mean it just doesn't look that great and like i said attention to detail why would you put out product shot of a shoe um primarily marketed towards sneakerheads and not have it laced up correctly it just doesn't make any sense don't get me wrong i'd rather they just do this than do another naff picture of some dude wearing pin rolls and leaping from somewhere or putting his feet into a bit of water or slow mowing down a bit of stairs cool but still as product shots this just don't don't look great i mean they look just terrible um but like i said overall model itself is pretty okay um again i'm a big um hiroshi fujiwara fanboy so anything he does I'm, I'm automatically a fan of so i do like the colorway i do like the application of it on this dunk uh, you know the little branding here on the outsole with some of the i guess the model number and whatever it may be on the outside kind of hiroshi fujiwara's, hiroshi fujiwara's signature you've got the double thunderbolt here towards the back of the heel which is also going to be an instant um value sort of like a cute no, value boost on the shoes i feel those kind of things when they put the logo on the side they change the tongue labeling those are always things that are going to add to the resale but overall as a model on the dunks just a waste of opportunity i just in, in my opinion i feel like does Hiroshi even wear dunks day to day i'm not too sure he obviously make them look great you put them on with a pair of you know um levi's um with a pair of you know very expensive levi's with a nice john smedley knit piece or something a louis vuitton tote bag or something Jeremy, he will make them look a bit swaggy but as they look at the moment i'm just generally not a fan i have to be completely honest i just think it's a waste of opportunity i think nike are doing everything in their power to make the dunks a thing they really want the dunks to be an absolute thing thing but it's just not going to be a thing in my opinion it's just they just 
not that popular, not that great. Um, outside of maybe Dunk SBs, do you ever see anybody actually wearing Dunks day to day? And even Dunk SBs, who, where's the last person in time you see somebody actually wear one of those funny coloured Dunk SBs that they put out? They don't sell that well. The only people I see actually wearing them are skaters sometimes who happen maybe to get them free because they're on the team or they got floater pair, whatever it may be. But day to day, in terms of wearing them, like actual trainers, battering them, not like people that are going to stand in the middle of the road and pose with their color coordinated outfit. No, I mean, people actually wearing them day to day. I don't see many people wearing them. I don't think they're popular. They're never really going to overtake an Air Force One. They're never going to come close to overtaking a Jordan. So it's a bit of a wasted opportunity. I will know the legacy, whatever it may be. But look at them. Look at the lacing. Come on, man. Do you honestly think that? That's like, and they're going to be charging you what 150 pounds for these, right? And they don't even have the decency to relace the shoes, right? They just took them out of the box, put them next to each other, and took a picture on an SLR. Look at the quality of this lever as well. Forget the lace, look at the lever. Look at that lever. That lever is shocking. If, if you don't see this, right, if you listen to the podcast, it's basically the lever on one of the flaps that goes towards the front of the shoe, uh, towards the top of the shoe is basically creased all over. And in Dunk story or in Dunk history, whoever puts their lace eyelets through the top of those um, two eyelets here, who does that? No one. Look at this. It's all creasing all over the place. Just looking at it, it looks like it's going to crease. Jesus Christ. Maybe the lever on this part of it, on the toe box, is a bit better right then the le then the lever on that on the outside but it just doesn't look great man it really really doesn't quality wise like and they're gonna want to charge you an arm and a leg for these you're gonna have to enter many many raffles you're gonna have to tag your friend in the comments you know leave a heart message send them a proof of your negative covid test like you have to do so many nonsense things to get these shoes and the finish on them look at even the back of like oh yeah yeah like this is why people buy reps look at the finish on, on the back of these shoes Look, <laughs> come on, man. Like, <laughs> like uh, honestly, like imagine trying to be a sneaker authenticator at StockX or something. It's legitimately a thankless task. Like, you just got to hope that some of the rep stores don't do um, faithful replica. Usually they don't anyway because people just want the shoe. They don't care about how accurate they are. If they're, 90, if they're like 70% accurate, they'll still buy them. So you just got to hope if you're a sneaker authenticator, if you're StockX in general, you just got to hope by and large, the actual big money maker shoes don't get repped as well as you'd hope they do. Because if they do get repped as well as Nike, as badly as Nike make them, like look at this, look at all the lumpy bits. Look at the, the pattern cutting on here. It's just the finishing, the seam is just terrible, right? Terrible, absolutely terrible. But hey, you know, people are going to queue up for them. Will I probably end up getting them? Probably. Do you know what I mean? All this talk of me talking, am I still going to enter the raffle? Probably I am. They got us by the balls, mate. They got us by the balls. This is a form of modern day slavery. Kanye West was right, mate. This is horrible. Horrible. Look at this. It's... The, 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 the quality is just absolutely shocking they've got a couple of thunderbolts in the back and already, i'm already creaming my pants even though the quality of the lever is absolutely diabolical yaza yaza mean um so yeah leave it. the advert's pretty cool though the advert's the coolest bit about it at least they relaced the shoes in the advert thank god right for this um is this a is this a magazine or just it looks like an, they've just taken an inspiration from some of the old school japanese sneaker mags and made like a little you know piece of advertising for it so thank god they released the shoe for the advertising look how different look at the improvement of the shoe from that right to this in terms of just how it looks right in terms of just how it looks and the about the appeal of you being able to buy them maybe i'm looking too much into it but look look how shitty they look here and look how much interesting they look there that looks like a far better proposition right in terms of buying a shoe that just looks cooler doesn't it like, oh, I don't, don't know why it's so hard, man. Um, is there a date for them yet? We start to check out. Hirachi, the, the, they've got a date. The Nike Fragment Design Dunk Low is scheduled to release on June 5th. Oh, it's called a Beijing. I don't know why it's called a Beijing. What's the inspiration about Beijing with this? Who knows? Um, priced at 170 US dollars, mate. 170 US dollars for a pair of dunks is just wild considering, you know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. We move on. We move in. What else do we have to talk about here? What article? Oh, yeah, this is a pretty wild story. It's just courtesy of the Wall Street Journal. Do you remember ages? Well, remember a few months ago when Neymar announced that he was, or did he announce he was leaving? Whatever happened, something happened with Neymar with Nike, 
in terms of um, his sponsorship where he basically ended or the partnership was ended. We didn't really get the details. We don't even know why he ended up leaving. But then soon after we heard that he had announced like a really big deal with Puma. And at first I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Why is the, um, Neymar going to Puma? But then, you know, the synergy with him kind of emulating Pele and beating Pele's international goal scoring record and all that malarkey. There were some links there, you know, in terms of what was going over there. But it just didn't make any sense why somebody as glitzy as a Neymar would want to go to a place like Puma. But then of course he went to Puma. He makes the boots instantly look amazing. I want to you know, purchase him myself because he's one of my favorite players. But then now, courtesy of the Wall Street News, they've broken the news that allegedly the reason why Neymar uh, left Nike was because of a sexual assault scandal, right? Something happened untoward whilst he was at Nike that they investigated and then that inevitably inevitably led to him departing Nike and then signing on to uh, Puma. But I don't know why we're only learning about this now. It's pretty wild isn't it, that they buried this. Like, you know, Neymar is that powerful and that uh, popular of an entity. Oh, not powerful. No, not popular. Yeah, that powerful of an entity in sports that they were able to bury a very um, serious sexual assault scandal or probe allegedly that he was basically at the heart of in order to protect him so they can protect the money and whatever and then allowed him to sign on to Puma with little to no fanfare and now the story's been broken like pretty crazy so it says the fear um courtesy of Wall Street Journal <coughs> text with a WhatsApp baby um it says Nike and soccer superstar Neymar split lo- uh, split ways last year after the company started investigating an allegation by a Nike employee that the Brazilian athlete had sexually assaulted her, according to people familiar with the matter and documents reviewed by the Wall Street Journal. Wild. And I've never heard of this. Obviously, we heard of that one woman who accused Neymar of, you know, R-A-P-E. And allegedly, she obviously lied about that, I think. I think it was it Neymar or Christian Ronaldo? I think it was Neymar. Remember, there was a scandal with a girl at a club somewhere. And then she retracted the, the, the story. She retracted the allegation. But that's the only thing I've heard. But I never heard about this, right? This is a Nike employee. Absolutely insane. Um, in August 2020, Nike didn't publicly give a reason for the early end to its endorsement deal with one of the world's most recognizable athletes. Nike's marketing contract with Neymar had another eight years remaining, of course, right? Because they always sign, they always lock down athletes to really long term bumper deals. Obviously, for the athlete, it's great. It looks you in. But again, if you're able to kind of generate a huge amount of income for Nike, they're just going to keep topping it up again and again and again, right? For instance, like Cristiano Ronaldo, I couldn't see him departing or leaving Nike in any way, shape or form because his brand is intrinsically tied to Nike. If he does leave Nike, it'll be for an insane bag, isn't it? Because you'd think that, you know, they're not, they're not going to want to want to have Christian Ronaldo walk away and you know walk into another sports brand um, offices and sign a deal with them because they know automatically he's bringing all the sales that he, he kind of had at Nike directly to that brand so they don't want that whatsoever so w- when they let people like this go there's definitely it must be something big it's not just you know some s- small inconvenience that they let them go it's definitely something that you know they thought okay if we if we keep this guy and this news come out this is going to be more detrimental than if we let him go it continues the Nike employee had told friends as well as Nike colleagues in 2016 that Neymar in 2016 and he only got let go in 2020 Jesus Christ <laughs> honestly when you're rich and famous man you can get away with the most heinous of things isn't it honestly you can and it's even worse for professional footballers because they're basically like adult babies, especially people like Neymar, who I love. But he's basically been a child prodigy since he was like basically a kid, right? A, a, a national, a, a worldwide phenom since the age of what, 16, 17, when he burst onto the scene at Sao Paulo? Like, was it Sao Paulo or Santos? with a white and black kit. Was it Santos? I forgot which one it was. But regardless of whatever team he played in Brazil, he was really young with a Mohican, skipping through defenders, getting absolutely clouded all over the place on those long, you know, on those pitches with long grass. 2016. This is wild. Um, she told Nike, uh, she told um, Nike colleagues 2016 that Neymar tried to force her to perform oral sex in a hotel room. Oh my God. While in New York City, where he was, she was helping to coordinate events and logistics with Neymar and his entourage, according to people, um, including former and current Nike employees and documents. That is terrible. Again, just doing your job. Sometimes I think of these people, I, I wonder what, maybe, maybe it's just a kink. Maybe it's the fact that you've done everything. So you want to keep pushing yourself in terms of your scratching your sexual desires, allegedly, I would assume. And who knows if this is true? Don't, don't sue me. 
But I've always wondered why people do this in position like someone in the name of position. Why would you do this? You have access to whatever female you want and then you try to then come on to somebody who's just working, doing a job, right? Maybe they don't even give a F about you as a sportsman. They just want to do a good job and continue to pay the bills and keep roof over their head, right? They're pursuing their passion. They're working for one of the coolest brands in the world. They've basically got the dream job. They're doing what they love. They're traveling around the world. Why would you why would you do that to somebody that's going to permanently scar them it's probably going to lead to them having to leave especially if somebody luckily she was able to put the thing through and i guess it was successful whatever it may be but sometimes if you work in some companies and you say allege you know accuse somebody of something untoward and they happen to be a big client of the company you're working in some companies will tell you the victim to go and skedazzle you'll be the one that will get ostracized you'll be the one that will get let go you'll be the one that'll be pressurized into maybe handing in your resignation because that person that client's money is where worth more to them than the well-being of their own employee so just that one action of first and you know sexual lust that that guy has who has access to every girl he wants i'm sure neymar's dms are insane is going to lead to somebody eventually losing their livelihood damaging you know the prospects of their immediate family and maybe damaging and tarnishing their reputation in the jobs market forever right it's just so unnecessary and so unfair that's the thing i think about it. it's just really really unfair 2016 and it only comes to light now in 2021 i don't know why it's come to light by the way but jesus christos um the the, the in new york hotel room she was helping coordinate the, the, the um neymar denies the allegation his spokesman said neymar jr will vir, 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 vigorously defend himself against these baseless attacks in case in in case any claim is presented which do, did which did not happen so far Oh, let's go that again. Neymar will v vigorously defend himself against his basic attack attacks in any case. Oh my God, why can't I speak today? Neymar Jr. will vigorously defend himself <laughs> against these baseless attacks in case any claim is presented, which did not happen so far, she said in a statement. She said Nike and Neymar split for commercial reason. Hmm. That's a very carefully worded statement. Nothing's been alleged. But you know what I mean? It's a very, it's a very, very curious statement. That very, very professional. A Nike employee filed a complaint in 2018 and described the incident in the company's head of human resources and general counsel. According to people in the documents, Nike hired lawyers at Cooley LLP to conduct an investigation, starting in 2019, and decided to stop featuring Neymar marketing and made the probe. According to people and documents, so they did. So they did the same thing that did happen to um, ASAP Bari, right, young lord, where he got accused of what he got accused of. Well, that video came out of him doing what he did in the hotel room and then nike i guess behind the scenes was still sort of like helping him out with stuff but public facing wise they put out that statement they ended the relationship and all that malarkey right that's kind of what they did in a similar sort of way uh, but obviously with neymar's you know profile it's a lot bigger of a deal in terms of marketing material and that sort of malarkey um so that so i guess that means he doesn't probably feature in any of the paris Saint Germain jordan collaboration stuff i'm assuming right I assume. Um, Nike ended this relationship with Neymar 2020 after the athlete wouldn't cooperate with the Cooley investigation. Wow. Some of the people said. They said the probe wasn't completed when the business relationship ended. Nike ended this relationship with the athlete because he refused to cooperate in good faith investigation of a credible allegation of wrongdoing by the employee, said Hillary Crane, Nike's general counsel, in the response to the question from the journal. Miss um, Crane said Nike did previously discuss, didn't previously discuss the matter publicly because no single set of facts Facts emerged that would enable us to speak substantively on the matter. It would be it would be inappropriate for Nike to make an uh, accusatory statement without being uh, able to provide a support supporting facts. So they're hiding behind the idea that they couldn't prove without any, you know, reason of a doubt that it did happen. But because there was enough smoke without fire, and then Neymar didn't want to cooperate, he decided to walk without getting fired so that the story wouldn't come out, right? There was a weird little game of chess there because Nike couldn't come out and accuse him or anything because if they did, it would mean that they were complicit in keeping the story sort of like away from the press since 2018. And then they also couldn't come out and accuse him because they didn't have the evidence to accuse him with or they weren't willing to present it to the public. And then Neymar also didn't want to publicly address it because if he did, it would have put more eyes to the situation. Madness, isn't it? Neymar spokeswoman, 
said the two sides have been in discussion since 2019. It's very strange, a case that was supposed to be happening in 2016 with allegations by a Nike employee came to light only at the moment, which is true. Representative from Neymar disputed the woman's account during the Cooley probe, but the athlete himself refused to inter interview by Nike to investigate, some people said. Now, the only reason why I would say this probably sounds true is because I never heard of this story. Because usually you'd imagine when somebody is involved in a, some situation like this and they can't get any justice through the, you know, legal, professional ways, there was some times leak the story to like other outlets or like to you know bloggers or whatever they may be or commentators whatever right and the story would come out in some way shape or form right so to kind of put the pressure on those companies in that way but i've heard absolutely nothing this is the first time i've ever ever hearing of this story so it leads me to believe that this was this did actually happen the person involved is just a regular because i think people don't realize too when this happens to people especially women in this industry in industries such as marketing and entertainment with malarkey they're just regular people working the job some of them don't want to be in front of camera. Some of them don't want to be a known figure or like a public figure, right? They just want to keep, they just want to do their amazing cushy job, you know, yeah, uh, you know, eat lunch on a company card, be able to, you know, give their friends a couple of shoes here and there, get good discounts in the Nike store, all that good stuff that happens working in the company at Nike without all the attention of being an Instagram influencer, right? It's a perfect job basically to have. You get paid a monthly wage, to, you know, you don't have to upload crazy pictures of yourself standing in the middle of the road with a colour coordinated outfit. Um, but you also get the luxury of having all the perks associated with it. So the fact that this person didn't come out and, you know, try to use an opportunity to boost their profile or to segue into other business opportunities or to allow themselves with some sort of activism um cause out there or something whatever leads me to believe that this has happened to a regular professional working woman who just doing their job got put in a really awkward and you know frightening and probably um intimidating situation and i'd guess maybe only plus up the courage to say something in 2018 because it's neymar it's a flipping global force you're not going to come out immediately and say one of nike's top 10 clients is saying something until this untoward just off the bat you're going to definitely give it some time and then when she did give it time nothing changed and then now eventually the story is coming out so it makes complete sense a timeline for me in my opinion i don't know if it's true or alleged but who knows um an attorney for nike employee did not respond to request a comment neymar de silva santos 29 years old signed with nike at the age of 13 before he became a professional player in brazil madness and then a star in europe he became the most expensive player in the history of soccer where paris Saint Germain paid the icy barcelona a protracted contract fee of 260 million from in 2017 the flashy goal scorer is the leader of the brazilian national team and recently signed a contract to century with psg a top french football club throughout 2025 neymar was the face of nike brand in south america with his signature shoes and apparel as you can see there on the thing um and it was among the highest paid nike athletes neymar will no longer be a nike player as of the 31st of 20 uh, the 31st of um, august 2020 Nike's person said about two weeks later december 12th puma se announced they had endorsement deal with uh, neymar uh, welcome to the fam neymar the king is back so obviously puma knew but they just said you know what we're willing to take the risk there's too much money involved in this one a spokesperson for puma declined to comment of course they did <laughs> they just dropped a bag on him they can't be going out there saying anything public about this no 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 no. you got to pretend it didn't happen they might discuss his move to puma in a message last september he said i grew up watching videos of the great football legends as pele croif and mateus eusebio and maradona he said i wish to bring back the legacy that those athletes created on the pitch um they each played in puma and each of these created their image created their magic is the king created magic in the king okay the puma king neymar was more than um to be fair when you were those black and white puma kings the first time he was announced for psg <sighs> disgusting they looked absolutely fire do you know what I mean? don't don't get me wrong there's one thing neymar can do for you he'll make you buy the boots he's wearing and you'll make you want to get the haircut he's wearing that's one thing he definitely can do. But this other stuff is mad. Neymar has more than 150 million followers on Instagram. Jesus. Along with Puma, he has a marketing partnership with Red Bull, Qatar Airlines, Perk Stars. Um, according to his website, in recent months, Neymar unveiled marketing deals with the brand Superdry, Epic Games, uh, maker of the popular Fortnite game. So I, I hate when they put these things in the articles. It feels like they're kind of snitching. They're hoping that people read it and get outraged and be like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. And then they start tagging all the brands on Twitter. It feels like to me, it's always a little bit underhand that's a clever kind of like well i didn't do nothing right it's sort of like you know you throw a stone but you hide your hands it wasn't me it wasn't me i didn't do nothing 
Ugh. Neymar traveled to New York City in late May and early June 2016 on a Nike publicity campaign where he visited the city field and met with basketball great Michael Jordan to drum up excitement for a shoe collaboration between Nike Jordan and the soccer star. The woman, a long-time Nike employee who's still employed at Nike, which is good, good to hear, was working with other Nike employees to coordinate the logistics of Neymar and his entourage for the Jordan event in Manhattan. The people said the group celebrated the event with the Up and Down nightclub. The people said after midnight um, in the early hours of June the 2nd, the hotel staff asked a woman along with other Nike employees to help Neymar who appeared to be intoxicated into his room at the hotel. The woman told friends and Nike colleagues that the night in subsequent days she told people that when she was briefly left alone in the room with Neymar he took off his underwear. Oh my god! She said Neymar tried to block her from leaving the room and then chased her down the hotel hallway while he was still undressed. Oh my god. Just imagine what these footballers get up to behind clothes. You always, you, you can guess which one's a bit loose but imagine Neymar has been signed to Nike since he was 13. Basically, he's been a celebrity, a heartthrob since he was 13 years old. He must be a terror. And every club he's been at so far, maybe with the exception of Barcelona, he's got exactly what he wanted, right? Barcelona he basically left because he felt as if like he couldn't be Neymar the brand under Messi, right? He kind of had to go and create his own legacy at PSG, which he kind of has done. But of course, you know, the, the final chip, the winning of the Champions League has sort of evaded him. Maybe he can do that with his, you know, with his new contract extension he's got at the moment. But, you always got the feeling that this guy was a bit of a brat, innit, right? Brilliant footballer, but definitely a bit of a brat. So just imagine what he must be like behind the scenes. Imagine what people at Nike and during shoot days must actually think of him. Like He must be that kind of person where if you went to work and do some branding deals with a company and you sat down in the hair and makeup place and you spoke to some of the guys and girls who work behind the scenes and said, oh, who's the person that's a nightmare? behind the scenes they'll definitely i would imagine say someone like neymar for sure i would imagine so i don't know i've not seen him i don't know anything about the guy but i would imagine if you ask him behind the scenes a personality like neymar would definitely be at the top of the list for sure um she told these people that when she was briefly at the London, the, the employees shared the incident with several friends and family members and Nike employees that night. And in the following days and weeks, the people said the employee made a complaint in 2018 when other Nike women stepping forward to share experience of harassment and assault. See, there we go. Because if someone powerful makes complete sense, 2016, 2018 makes sense. I thought it was 2016, then they got flipping announced in 2020. But no, it happened in 2016. She stayed stoned because obviously it's flipping Neymar. You don't want to ruin your career, which is probably a smart thing to do, especially at that time, 2016 socially we weren't really in the space i guess to maybe accept those allegations or it would nothing would have happened anyway she would have come out she would have only ruined her own career which is definitely not worth it um and then 2018 off the back of everybody else kind of coming out with their story which is probably the reason why people coming out and sharing their news is probably a good thing she didn't decide to also come out and say it um da -da -da. She, and she the employee made a complaint 2018 and other women at Nike were stepping forward to share experiences of harassment and discrimination as part of a survey about the treatment of women at the company, according to the people and documents. At the time, the employee shared details about the alleged incidents with Monique Matheson, the head of Nike Human Resources Department. Human Resources people are so awful, barely useless. Miss Crane, Nike Council, and according to the people of the document, Neymar continued to appear in marketing material the following year. Around that time, the Women's World Cup in, uh, in France, Neymar appeared in 2019 commercial about female athletes and their dreams. <laughs> you couldn't you could make this up, could you? You couldn't make this up, man. Also, in June 2019, another woman accused Neymar of rape at a Paris hotel a month earlier. Neymar said the encounter with a woman, a Brazilian, was consensual and she accused him of extorting him. The Brazilian authorities dropped the investigation of Neymar, citing lack of evidence. What was the one where, wasn't there one where someone accused him of RAAP and supposedly text messages came out where it basically proved it to be incorrect? Did it Neymar put out? Am I mistaken? Remember that? Um, authorities in Brazil later charged the model with slander and extortion and produced um, procedural fraud. The slander and extortion charges were dismissed in 2019 and she was acquitted of the fraud case in 2020. A spokeswoman for the model said she stands by original account. Wow. Okay. She got she got sued for it, went to court, the cases got dropped and she still stands by her story. So maybe that, that accusation was true who knows in june 2019 after the brazilian model made her public allegation the nike employee approached miss crane and mr matheson to ask the status of the complaint in 2019 she followed it up right uh, hr are useless at these big corporations pretty much useless hr in front of house are probably one of the most useless occupations that exist in most big corporations they just basically get away with just doing absolutely nothing and they still keep their job like enough no performance you know evaluations no real kpis nothing miss crane matheson to us to say this with the complaint 
She made about an email a year earlier, according to the people in the documents. Nike executive told the employee they hadn't taken any action because they had been under an impression she didn't want them to. Oh my God. <laughs> Ms. Crane said that the, that when the employee first relayed the allegation to Nike leadership in 2018, she did so on the condition of confidentiality. Just because she want, I want to keep my name out of the papers doesn't mean I don't want you to go forward with it, you absolute toshers. As her employer, we had a responsibility to respect her privacy and did not believe it was appropriate to share that information with law enforcement or third party without the employees. Because so why didn't you ask her? So basically, they didn't ask and they didn't tell. Like she, she, she came forward. She comes through. With, she comes forward with the allegation. They, she says to protect my privacy. They said okay then. They don't want to follow it up or anything, so they don't ask her any follow-up questions. They just basically file it and pull it under the folder and hope she forgets about it. Mamma mia. In 2019, when the employee later expressed... And again, this is a woman too. She's going to a woman in HR about a sexual misconduct allegation against somebody really powerful, a powerful dude. And then they do nothing about it. Which is why I always say the actual main enemy of women is other women. Because that woman just wants to keep her job too. She doesn't want to you know, uh, push this forward, like funnel it through the levels of kind of whatever it may be, s severity, because a, a light would then get shone on her too. So she wants to just basically, you know, file it on, in, in the bottom drawer and hope that girl forgets about it. Maybe give them a bonus to kind of sweeten the deal. I would imagine, allegedly, I don't know, don't sue me. It continues um, from the very beginning. We have treated employee allegations of experience with seriousness. In 2019, Nike ramped up the investigation into 2016. So of course, because I guess that's when the whole Harvey Weinstein and Me Too thing was happening. Oh, scumbags and lawyers from Cooley conducted interviews with witnesses including no maybe that's part of the allegations that are happening in Nike with the unsafe and workplaces and not treating uh, women fairly the work remember there's a thing about that right with the maternal leave and all that stuff including Nike employ so it continues here in 2019 um like it the investigation into 2016 an incident and lawyers from Cooley conducted interviews with witnesses, including Nike employees and the people that said, and the documents show Nike helped the employee retain counsel and Nike agreed to pay her legal fees. Of course, at least you can do it. The people said in the documents show Cooley's lawyer, Amanda Main said, made, uh, said her firm conducted an extensive and thorough investigation, both within the company and through external sources. Neymar's spokeswoman said similar to the sexual allegations against him in 2019 allegations, which prison uh, found innocent these allegations are false jesus christ name my man what are you doing in meetings with nike executive the woman requested that nike tell the public that neymar's behavior didn't align with the values start enforcing morality clauses in athletes contracts and adopt a code of conduct so there's no morality clause that makes sense isn't it it makes sense isn't it because look at those uh, look at all those american footballers that beat up their wives and stuff right they don't necessarily lose their brand deal straight away they probably get fired and suspended from the league or the, from the nfl before they get any brand endorsement gets taken away from them like the morality morality does not exist in sports um uh, uh franchises or you know companies and endorsements it doesn't exist it's no such thing uh, uh in meetings the dirt code of contact in august 20 in august the 30th nike confirmed that neymar was no longer with the brand so they didn't actually confirm it. they put that clause in they just confirmed he's no longer with the brand nike continues to be the jersey sponsor of both neymar's clubs um meaning it's whoosh it still appears on uniforms neymar wears and his number 10 writes kadeja saftar at the wall street journal raw dead man raw dead. i wonder if this is the neymar cancellation i don't know what's going on but this is wild bruv but he must be powerful as hell. He must generate some money if he's able to, you know, keep the lid on a su super serious sexual assault allegation like this. It's 2016, out of the news. Like, a even Nike didn't want to press forward with it. Mad, isn't it? Especially when you consider how woke they are, right? They didn't want to press with it. They were like, no, nah, we don't want that name on smoke. It's like, Jesus Christ, man. He must be powerful. Oh, what can you do in it? Hopefully she gets um, the help and support that she needs, man, because that's not what you want to hear in it. That's definitely not what you want to hear. For sure, for sure, for sure. Um, Let's continue on here. Mm -mm 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 -mm. What else we got here? Oh, this is pretty funny. This is courtesy of resident advisor. Exit offers vaccines to international artists and festival goers. This exit festival, you remember there was... I think maybe during the peak of COVID, there was many occasions where it seemed like Exit was going to be the only festival that was going to go on. I think it's in Serbia, right? The only festival that was going to happen. There was loads of kind of couple of full storms and eventually kind of got 
postponed or cancelled because there's just too much risk involved. And they still want to be one of the big sort of like mainstream festivals that does declare everything's open, go back to normal. And they're doing everything in their power to make sure people go in it. But the lineup is just horrendous, like legitimately horrendous. Like traveling to Serbia, beautiful enough country as it is, to go see these people is a legit waste of time. Maybe go to Serbia for the holiday, but going to see these artists is just a waste. Um, it says here, Exit has announced it will offer vaccines to international artists and festival goers as it as it um, as its events as an event in the summer. The Serbian festival, which will be held in the Novi Sad from July the eighth to the eleventh, is also a collaboration with the Ministry of Health to allocate three hundred free opening night tickets to medical workers. Okay, so it's partly a tourism initiative i'm imagining only those who have already been vaccinated have had a covid in the past or can produce a negative pcr test will be able to allow them the festival site um it says here look at look at the djs they're playing though fair enough they're giving you a good deal but look at the people that are playing look at who's playing dj snake sabaton nina kravitz paul paul kalkenbrenner um dax j back to back with kabolsi right that jesus christ at a serbian festival like count this is why sometimes i understand why people are like they're off they're not really fans of festivals because the programming on this festival makes no sense right like look at the day one dj snake sabaton nina kravitz paul whatever his name is dax j versus back to back with cabal seal metronomy right um whoever the other the other people are on that list i don't really know of i guess they may be local people um day two you got tiger solomon dennis salter that absolute weapon um dennis salter looks like a walking advertisement for flipping cat doesn't he like he's always sweating and <laughs> i don't know some person called topic amira whatever that name is francois x goblin lazy runny whoever these people are they free asaf avidan and I bet they've all got millions of followers, right? They do really well. They fly in private jets. They all wear... Um, what's that thing that all those EDM people like wearing? Burberry. Balenciaga with the logo on it. Off-White. Um, obviously, Boris, whatever his name is, Bajinjin, the, the other kind of Rick Owens type designer. Obviously, some Rick if they're a bit more dark. Whatever brand they like wearing. Sometimes merch. That's about it, right? Yeah. Um, so on day three, Asaf Eviden, uh, Boris, how do you pronounce his name with the masks? Um, Honey Dejon, Hot Since 82, of course, he's there. Uh, Medusa, Paul Van Dyke, After Affair, Back to Back with Christian Molina, Pion, Space Motion, DJ Aqua P, DJ Dapper, Dap Peace, Dram E Player. Uh, oh my God. Day four. Uh, David Guetta, Eric Price, back to back with Forte. <sighs> Look at day four. David Guetta, Eric Price, back to back with Forte, um, Art Bat, and Sheck West. Could you ever get more diverging acts than than that? Like honestly, the bag must be insane. Oh look, uh, VTSS playing back to back with SPDFG, so she she's um, SP SPF DJ, so they're definitely dropping their bag. So for sure, it's going to be a lot of good money for them. They're probably going to be able to make up some of the wages they've lost out on. So I'm happy for the DJs in that regard. But as a festival guy, as a fan of dance music, this seems like the most yucky festival to ever attend in the history of time. Like that just that just doesn't look like a good time to me. But yeah, if you're a fan of it, go there, I guess, and find out details for tickets. <laughs> if you're a fan of it, but god damn it, not for me. But anyway, it's one hour thirty now. I'll leave you for now. That's the action zing show episode number four six two, I think. I think sure it was. If it's the first time tuning into the show, thank you so much. If you're watching via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast, that please leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends and the course support via Patreon. It's always more than welcome at patreon.com for slash A G O S T I N H O. That's patreon.com for slash Agostino to get access to all my bonus episodes as well as bonus content only available from Patreon for as little as one dollar, the equivalent of one pound per month. Sign up on Patreon, help a kid out. I'll greatly appreciate it. And until next time, see you again. Peace.